Okay. Um, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here in Barcelona again. And I'd like to uh, thank the um, steering committee for the opportunity to uh, give this um, brief update on GIST. Uh, these are my disclosures. I'm going to mainly talk about advanced disease, but uh, if there's time, just a couple of slides on adjuvant therapy. So if we're going to uh, understand where we're going, we need to know where we've come from, as it's been said in the, uh, classically, and so I'm going to review some of the um, uh, areas that have uh, happened over the last few years, uh, but in order to get some feeling for the current uh, advances. To remind you, GIST is a mes mesenchymal neoplasm, commonest um, um, tumor of its type in the GI tract. Uh, it arises from the interstitial cells of Cajal, uh, which responsible for peristalsis. The clinical presentation is uh, maybe variable, and the diagnosis is sometimes uh, still challenging, although most people, m mostly this is now a well-recognized entity. Of course, it's diagnosed with immunohistochemistry and the kit protein is positive in 95% of cases, uh, but the DOG1 um, um, immunohistochemistry test is also uh, strongly positive in the majority of patients, including uh, some of the kit negative gists. Uh, this is the schematic of the two g main genes involved in gist, and in, in a sense, this is the prototype, uh, this is the prototype uh, driver mutations. Um, so you see here on the left uh, the, uh, the KIT gene. Um, you see the KIT gene and the PDGF receptor alpha gene. Uh, the KIT gene uh, is mutated in about 78% of patients, uh, PDGF receptor alpha in about 7.5% of patients, and within the KIT gene, the exon 11 is the most common mutation that occurs. But if there's, a, if there's any central theme or message to this talk, it's the importance of actually looking at mutations. It helps us understand the biology of this disease and indeed is helping us understand some of the new treatments that are coming through. But in, increasingly now, we are recognizing the entity of wild-type GIST. So this accounts for about 15% of uh, patients in which there is no mutation in KIT and no mutation in the PDGF receptor alpha gene. And you can see a range of uh, um, abnormalities that occur in, in wild-type KIT, um, particularly succinate dehydrogenase family of genes has been recognized recently, uh, as well as BRAF mutation and uh, some of the uh, NF1 mutation in pediatrics. Here you see that uh, in, a, in a, a study pr uh, presented last year that uh, looking for uh, other gene abnormalities in wh what's called quadruple wild-type GIST, so that's GIST which is wild-type for KIT, PDGF receptor alpha, RAS, and succinate dehydrogenase. And here's the recognition of the FGF1 receptor. And indeed, um, these, this quadruple wild-type GIST is probably recognized by either fusions of FGF1 uh, R1 or NTRAC fusions, and we've heard about uh, drugs that inhibit both of these um, 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 types of fusions uh, at this meeting. Again, it causes uh, GIST in the uh, slightly younger age group, more common in the stomach, and here you see some nodal metastases. Um, you'll, be, you'll recall, of course, that GIST can occur anywhere throughout the GI tract, although the majority occur in the stomach. But this slide is to remind you that you can't tell from the location uh, how, the, how the patient's going to behave. So in, in gastric GIST, uh, exon 9 mutations are less common than small bowel GIST, where they may account for 23%. But equally, in gastric GIST, a number of patients, almost a fifth of patients, will have abnormalities of the PDGF receptor alpha gene. And a number of those uh, will be resistant to imatinib and don't require uh, any treatment. So it's really important to remember the message that we need to test for mutations in this condition. In terms of the, um, just to remind everyone of where we've got to with advanced, with advanced disease, so these were the two pivotal studies done by the North American group and the um, European and Australasian and Scandinavian groups comparing 400 milligram a day to 800 milligram a day of GIST, no difference in overall survival, which led to the dose of 400 milligram being standard. However, in the Exxon 9 group, there is a, uh, there is a, a suggestion, that, at least in terms of progression-free survival, that they do better with a higher dose. 
Um, in terms of resistance to GIST, there's primary resistance occurs in about 15% of patients, but we are getting a much better handle on what's happening about secondary resistance, which occurs in about 50% of patients around the two to five year mark. In primary resistance, the commonest, um, the, the common um, mutations are the exon 9 mutations, which I've indicated require a higher dose. The PDGF receptor alpha uh, mutations, including the D842V, which doesn't re respond to imatinib, and uh, of course the wild type GIST. But really it's the secondary mutations uh, in, in GIST that are the most important, and uh, we'll uh, cover those very quickly. But reminding you that when we find patients who are n uh, resistant to imatinib, the standard algorithm that needs to go through our minds is one, confirm progression. Two, check the compliance is, is still present. Occasionally we need to test the blood levels, there's a role for surgery and focal uh, progressive disease, but ultimately we end up changing the, t the tyrosine kinase inhibitors and, there's, uh, and, and considering trials of new agents. In terms of changing the TKI, the first of these was the idea that we increase the dose of imatinib and there's limited data that suggests that people will respond to an increased dose. Um, if the imatinib is not working, we replace this with sunitinib. This is the pivotal sunitinib study that was reported a number of years ago now, sunitinib versus placebo. There was a major benefit in terms of progression-free survival on the left. Um, some initial thought that there was a benefit in overall survival, but with crossover, these curves were no longer significant in terms of overall survival. It's worth noting, though, that in, the, in these studies uh, with sunitinib, it was the exon 9 group that did best and the exon 11 group in yellow that t did poorly. And so when you've got patients with exon 11, which is the commonest group, and you change across to sunitinib, you need to watch them closely. Um, replacing sunitinib with regorafenib was the next change that occurred. And this was a study of regorafenib versus placebo, uh, known as the GRID study a very significant benefit in terms of progression-free survival, but again, with crossover, no difference uh, in overall survival. Um, this is, the, um, this is the, the intention to treat analysis I just showed you, but if you look at patients with secondary mutations in KIT, we see the same results. So again, here the regorafenib appears to be active, whatever the underlying mutation. But what about other TKIs when patients fail those three drugs? And here's the list of drugs that have been tried over a number of years. And the ones in white there, you can see all of them have some activity uh, from time to time. It's very hard to predict when. Uh, none of them are marketed for the treatment of GIST because there's no phase three studies that have, been, uh, that have been warranted to take forward. However, the two drugs in red at the bottom are now going into, or in phase three, that's blue 285 and the compound known as DCC2618, and I'll show you a bit of those data shortly. So here's blue 285, and this is probably a difficult slide to see, but if you can see um, at the very bottom of this table, um, just to illustrate the IC50 differences, so in, in red there, the bottom is uh, the IC50 with imatinib. Uh, it's in the 700 odd nanomole is the IC50 of imatinib. Compare that to blue, which is in green at the bottom, 0.24 nanomoles. So very powerful and very selective inhibitors of, uh, in this case, the exon 18 D842V mutation, which is known to be resistant to imatinib. So a phase one study was done with escalation into phase two, and uh, this is the waterfall plot where about two thirds of patients experience tumor shrinkage. This is the waterfall plot of the patients with a D842V mutation. So using a modified criteria for response, 100% response rate for this particular group of patients. And as a result of that, um, well, this is the PFS curves, and you can see the white bar is what we would expect with either the reuse of imatinib or alternatively uh, just placebo. Um, you can see that the median PFS is not reached in this D842V mutation in platelet-derived growth factor receptor. So um, the investigators of this study concluded that it was well tolerated. There were high response rates and prolonged PFS, particularly in the, in the platelet-derived growth factor gist. Um, there was prolonged PFS in the heavily pre-treated um, kit-driven gist, which I haven't shown you, and as a result, a phase three study is planned. This is the second of the new TKIs. It's called DCC2618. 
Uh, this study is in um, phase three now, and I'm on the steering committee of the phase three study by way of disclosure. Uh, this drug binds to the switch pocket of the kinase, stabilizing it in, in, in an inactive uh, conformation. And it also inhibits the very aggressive 17 and 18 gain of function mutations in the activation switch. Here's the waterfall plot, 91% disease control rate seen with DCC2618. Uh, this is the PFS curves, the curve in red is the, is the, the dose being used in the, in the phase three trial. And as a result of this, with a 91% disease control rate, this study is now in phase three as a fourth line agent following imatinib, sunitinib, and regorafenib. These patients are often of a reasonable performance status and there's a, a desperate need to find alternative uh, ways of treating these patients. Uh, so this is the phase three trial. As I mentioned, three prior lines of therapy um, and in a two-to-one randomization against placebo, but once again, uh, there will be crossover. The primary endpoint for uh, approval for this study um, is the progression-free survival. Uh, in terms of some of the other things that have been explored, uh, KIT and MEK inhibitors have been looked at as in in inhibitors of ETV1, uh, which is a lineage survival factor for GIST. Uh, Dasatinib and epilumumab, so that's a study with uh, a TKI and an immune checkpoint inhibitor, and uh, response rates have been seen in the early studies. Uh, no disease is immune from in, uh, an immune checkpoint trial, so this is nivolumab and nivolumab plus epilumumab. The study is underway, and once again, responses have been seen. And there is some dysregulation of the hedgehog pathway in this disease as well. So there are a number of, a number of trials underway in this disease, but the uh, two that I showed you, Blue 285 and the DCC 2618, are the only two TKIs that are moving into phase three. Um, the other thing that's happened in the past 12 months is that this study, which was conducted by the uh, Australasian Gastrointestinal Trials Group in collaboration with the Scandinavian Group uh, and, uh, and the EORTC, was a randomized phase two trial comparing continuous imatinib to imatinib alternating with regorafenib. That study completed late last year and uh, will report at ASCO next year. Uh, and, and the ESMO guidelines have just been published, uh, which are an update on the um, management of GIST, and I certainly uh, recommend that those involved in managing this d uh, disease uh, make reference to these guidelines. Finally, in terms of adjuvant therapy, uh, you'll be aware that the current uh, recommendations are that patients with high-risk GIST receive three years of imatinib. Um, this is a single-arm study of five years of adjuvant imatinib for patients at mainly high risk. Three-quarters of them had high-risk disease, uh, but a quarter had intermediate risk GIST. Um, about half the patients needed to withdraw because of uh, 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 issues with tolerance, um, but nevertheless, uh, that you can see the recurrence-free survival. And as we've seen with all the adjuvant studies, once the adjuvant therapy is discontinued, uh, there seems to be um, the development of, of the commencement of recurrences occurring. Um, so these are the three, uh, the two rather ongoing phase three randomized trials uh, in um, the adjuvant setting. Uh, the Scandinavian Sarcoma Group is conducting a study of three years versus five years uh, of uh, imatinib for patients at high risk of recurrence. And uh, there is a study um, that is being conducted of imatinib for three years, so that's the standard, uh, versus imatinib maintenance. And uh, again, these uh, studies are underway, but will take some time to report. I'd like to conclude by acknowledging the many patients and their families who contribute to these studies. It's been an enormous effort over a long time, and I've given you a very quick summary of uh, where we've come from and where we're going. Uh, groups like LifeRaft and other patient advocacy, advocacy groups have done an enormous amount to support patients. Uh, the many investigators that have designed and conducted these studies, and uh, I approached a number of them for some of their data, and then the many companies involved in this international effort. It has been an incredible international effort that's occurred over many years, and uh, we have reap, reaped the rewards of that, but we have more work to do. Thank you very much for your attention.